Fantastic. Well, it's a pleasure to contribute to this webinar series, and we plan for this to be a very practical exercise in overcoming the challenges of patch planning. Throughout the talk, there are going to be links and helpful pages dropped in the chat as well. And also, you guys, please do drop any questions that occur to you straight into the Q&A. Even if you think we might answer them as we go, it'd be great to see which things are coming up um, and occurring to you as we go through. Our hope is that this will be a useful nugget or two in here for you to help you make your patching lives easier. I'm Jeff. I've been at Scientifica for eight years, and throughout those eight years, I've been working with customers like you to design and quote these full systems. It can be a full system that we're starting from scratch for a new lab or expanding a lab, or as well visiting you in your labs to review your current systems, understanding what it can do now and where you want to take it to. And then together, we decide and we work on upgrades and improving your systems. Yasina is a product specialist just like me and an ex-patcher who did a PhD using scientific kit too. So that's our background and why we reckon we're in a good position to get a practical overview to help you. But then why Scientifica? Well, Scientifica has been doing what we do since 1997. First, we started distributing the Burley manipulator and then we designed our own Patchstar manipulator and that's grown to fully fizz rigs and even multi-photon systems. We've followed our customers through that journey. Scientifica is headquartered between London and Brighton, right between the two in the south of the UK, and we manufacture everything just outside of London in Maidenhead. We focus on electrophysiology and imaging. That's our world, and our aim is to be the most trusted provider of these systems. So who is this webinar for? Whether you're new to your PhD and just getting started, or if you've been at this for years, maybe even decades, we hope there'll be something useful for you in here. If you can leave this webinar with, a, with an idea to try on your scope that might solve a problem you've been having, then absolutely, that is, that is job done as far as we're concerned. So Scientifica is a manufacturer of full electrophysiology rigs. So let's address these challenges from the hardware side of things. Let's imagine we're starting our patching journey and we're just sat in front of a rig that's just become parts. The question is, is what sort of microscope is this? Is it going to be an upright or invert, as we see? So the question is, it's going to be based on whether you're working, say, in culture, monolayers of cells. Um, if you're doing that, you can use an inverted system where the objective comes from beneath. Um, you can access the cells easily that way, and it practically reveals a huge amount of space above your sample. Easier to get your pipettes in, and contrast techniques and things tend to lend themselves on these systems too. If you're working in slices which are relatively thick, um, you need to then uh, access them from above um, using, using an upright microscope. So the practical difference there is that the working distance of those objectives is going to be down into the millimetres. So it's a little bit more challenging to really get your pipettes in, but then that's where kit like this comes in to try and make that as easy as it possibly is. When you're looking at these systems, you can then subdivide them a little bit further. Um, you have um, a patching staging solution that you can build around another microscope, typically the Milpers, Nippon, Salas, Leica sort of microscope, or you can have dedicated systems from Scientifica who basically we provide the full system, do it fully motorized as well. Um, so on the very right hand side, there might be something that's a little bit new. To, to people, and that is our new solution for patching in cultures, essentially our inverted system. So now let's dive into the sort of key bits that as you're staring at this new system you've got, what's actually making it up? So predominantly this is a system that's going to aid you to visualize your cells and bring your patch pipettes down to the cells. So first things first, we're looking at the microscope itself. The questions are, what sort of brand is it? How, how old might it be? And ideally, who used it before you, if someone did? Um, be a fantastic source of information, of quirks about the system and its general capabilities. Then next is going to be sort of the staging and the motorization. We've got lots of different options for different staging in this world. Um, whether they're high up with everything mounted on the same platform, things low down, asking questions like, are my manipulators and, and my sample, are they linked with the staging or do they move independently? That'll affect how you can move around your sample as you get deeper. 
Um, and then fundamentally, does the microscope move or does my stage move? The next thing is your objectives in the objective changes. Now, in the world of upright microscopes for patching, you'll likely have two objectives that are easily split between or slide between. One's a relatively low magnification objective with a fairly high working distance that helps you get situated and begin to bring your pets in. Um, and then one is a higher working, uh, a higher magnification, typically then lower working distance objective too. Questions are, is, are the objectives that you have appropriate for the type of experiments you want to do? Is the trade-off with magnification and a shortening of working distance worth it for you? The next is going to be your condenser and your contrast. You'll need contrast on a system like this to be able to see yourselves. And there are several different types of contrast that are typically used, all of which are adjustable and work really well with a range of samples. There's no best option, no correct option as such. Um, Cross-referencing um, the different components using scientific knowledge base is a really good way to tell if you're not sure. And mainly, particularly if using differential interference contrast, which takes a lot of parts, the question is, are all of the bits there? And are they, are they all in the right positions to actually generate the image that you're attempting to get? The next section you can sort of look at is eyepieces. And there's a big usability point. Um, is, you know, do you have these eyepieces where you can look down the scope as you're working on, say, a fairly manual system? Maybe you have micrometers to move your stage, and you're manually adjusting in Z. It can be ergonomic quite nice to be there and looking down. But if you're in a world where your microscope is particularly motorized, you can be sat over your computer a lot more. Um, what we see is there's a bit of a, a sort of camp you fall into, it's which, which one you started with tends to maybe prevail as a preference. I've never seen swapping from a scope with eyepieces to a camera really trip anyone up too badly. Um, but the thing to remember, if you're on a scope that doesn't have eyepieces, you can probably add them if you'd like. And while we're talking about cameras as well, is huge range of cameras on these sort of systems. The question is, is the camera up to the right spec for you? Do you potentially want to do things like calcium or even voltage imaging now or in the future? Can, can the camera you have do that for you? And is it going to work into the future with software updates and things like that? The next thing, of course, is the manipulators. Um, what manipulators do you actually have around? Um, are they in good condition? Have they been mounted in a way that works for you? Um, do you have the room you need to interact with them? And can you swing them out in all of their glorious ways for adjusting and changing the pets? And as well, do they do things like move at a comfortable speed for you? Um, a lot of manipulators have the ability to go into software and adjust the speeds so you can really hone them to be ideal for you rather than just living the way they are. Then next is epifluorescence, uh, or, you know, reflected light path on your system. Now, you may or may not have this on your system. You may or may not need it. Um, if you do have it and you do need it, understanding how your light source works and if you have the right cubes to work for the wavelengths you need in your turret is going to be key and easily upgradable. Then kind of getting into um, things like the inline heater and perfusion. Um, there's a lot of questions about how has it been set up? Is it working nicely for you? Does it have the features you need or is it even too complicated? Potentially there's been drug applications been done in the past on a system that isn't necessary for you now. Do you need to use a complicated diffusion system or can you use a more simplified one? You streamline the system and have it, have it less complicated. Then, as a final point, the data acquisition. Um, there are lots of options here and understanding the capabilities of your setup will be key for sure. Understanding um, whether it's, you know, you're in the camp of um, Axon or HECA or even using um, open source softwares and things as well. So with a bit of that sort of, you know, large funnel down from the full systems, I'll hand over to Yasina, who will take you into even more detail. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the introduction on like the system in general. Uh, and I will continue with a little bit more introduction and that will be more on patch clamp in general. Uh, so I'll start out um, with the uh, different patch clamp techniques. Um, so uh, because Jeff already touched on this, right, when uh, he talked about inverted and upright microscopes. Um, so inverted microscopes are often used with cultured cells. Uh, and um, when you're talking about PET clamping in cultured cells, uh, this is a, 
a very practical technique, you can use many different sort of cells that you can then uh, electrically classify or uh, like characterize. Um, and uh, you can also uh, adapt these cells in multiple ways and you can easily apply all kinds of compounds. You can even measure uh, single channels, channels and what is the effect of the compounds on these. And this is uh, very often done in, in cultured cells. So this is a specific type of data. And then if we move on to the, um, uh, to the slices, so this is another type of sample that is often patched under an upright microscope, like Jeff said. Um, and uh, slices are usually fresh brain slices. So you take a brain and you keep the slices alive. And in this way, you can patch a cell or multiple cells that are still in a natural environment that can communicate to other cells uh, in the slice still. Uh, so you get a lot of information about the cell. And um, you get information about how the cell is connected to other cells or how it interacts with other cells. Uh, and then there's also in vivo patching. So one can uh, do the patch clamp technique in vivo where you can patch a single cell um, inside uh, an animal model, for example. And uh, then of course you get the real information of the cell uh, in the brain um, with all the the interactions with the brain still intact as they are. And this can even be done sometimes in awake animals, or you could do some stimulation, uh, even if the animal is anesthetized during uh, the experiment. Uh, so this is, again, a different type of data. And then, of course, we talked a lot about, um, about the equipment that we use already, and we will talk about it way more. Um, and this is all to get your pets by pet to your cell. Um, and then when you are at your cell, there are also different ways you can record. So if we look at the, the first picture, this is cell attached, where you just bring the pets by pet uh, to the cell and make a nice giga ohm seal on the cell membrane. And then you can uh, listen to the activity of the cell, basically. If you see spontaneous activi if activity, you can see it like this. And the advantage of this is that you won't disturb the cell at all. Um, but to um, influence the cell to control the membrane potential of membrane potential of the cell. You need to break in. You need to break the membrane. And you need to break into the cell, uh, and then you have full control over the membrane potential, and you can test how it spikes at different potentials and everything. Um, so this is very you get very valuable data out of it. Um, but you will diffuse the liquid from your pipette. Uh, into your cell, so you disturb the cell more. Uh, so there's also a way where you can do perforated patch with a perforating agent in, in the pipette, where you can kind of get best of both worlds. So you don't disturb the cell so much, but you do have some control. Um, and there's also, there are uh, different configurations where you take a, a patch of membrane and you only measure what's going in, on in this patch of membrane. An advantage here is that, um, the inside of the membrane is now facing the bath. So you can, uh, you have an easy time applying compounds to the inside of the membrane. So you can study certain channels in that way. So yeah, these are all kinds of different techniques that um, give different data. And then I want to talk a little bit about how you get this data, because as uh, Jeff mentioned at the beginning, I did my PhD and um, I patched in my PhD on a scientific scope also. So I just wanted to take you uh, through like how the patch comes to be, how you do the patch lamp experiment. And I decided to take this uh, beautiful flow chart uh, that was made by Nasrin Chaudhry for, uh, for our website uh, to help me guide you through it. Um, so to, to start, you need to fill the, the micro pipette and uh, put it around the electrode on your rig. And this is already a little bit of a challenging process because everything is very small. And on the scientific rig, it is, um, um, it's very practical. I always used these features of the patch stars that I had where you uh, can turn the pet star towards yourself. And I also use this, uh, yeah, you can see properly. Um, I use this feature where you can pull back the, um, the head stage. So you can easily like change the pipette. And there are some more features we will talk about uh, later. So you, you kind of like turn and uh, take the pipette and wiggle 
the pipette around the electrode. So it makes the, the point is to make the contact between the pipette and the intracellular uh, uh, medium that you have um, in your pipette. And this is what actually makes the contact because that's a salt solution. So this is what makes the electrical contact between the cell and your data acquisition. And that is the start of that uh, contact, that measurement. So this is this is important uh, to get it right. And then um, to uh, to then approach the cell, you need to find the pipette under your scope. I always did this in the um, in the highest magnification, and I think some people do it in the lower magnification, then switch to the higher. But I always did it in the highest. And oh, I had the student that was telling me like, oh, you must have very good eyesight because I was kind of staring at this pipette like if it was going underneath the magnification, because if you know your rig, you know when you can see when your pipette is in the uh, right place. But I don't think you really see it. It's more the knowing of the rig. So this can be a bit tricky um, if you are on a new rig or if you switch between rigs, you always have to make this way a bit. Um, and then if you have that, you are going to move down with the pipette and uh, the objective to a cell you picked. And you always move down with the objective first. Because if you would move down with the pipette first and you would go too far, you would um, destroy the cell you picked carefully, maybe because you would hit the tissue accidentally, or you would destroy the pipette or you would destroy both and the, um, the recording would not happen. So you carefully go down objective first and then pipette. And I always did it by hand with, um, with the wheels, so with the motorized uh, microscope and the manip manipulator, but with the wheels. But you can always also let the software do it. And so on the scientific uh, uh, scopes, there's a follow function. Um, and you can use that to just uh, make the pipette and objective go down at the same time. And then when you approach your cell, uh, when you see your cell in your pipette, you can approach the cell and you see the dimple and you take the pressure off of your pipette and you hopefully get a good seal uh, on your cell. And um, then you use the least advanced part of your uh, hundred thousand dollar rig that you have, you use a, um, or many people use a syringe that they have taken apart and then they just use their mouth to break into the cell, to apply suction to the cell, to break the membrane. Um, and I also did this all, always by uh, the suction by mouth and everything. It worked very well for me because you get a feeling for this and this is like, if you know how this works, this is the best, of course. But then the pandemic, of course, hit. So it took a pandemic for me. But then I decided to change my ways and go a lit little bit more advanced. So I took a complete syringe and I learned how to apply pressure with the syringe and with the three-way stopcock. You can control this very well. Uh, so that's the things you need. And it also helps to have a little uh, measurement, um, a little pressure meter in uh, in your tubing so you can see the pressure uh, on your pipette. That is very practical in many situations. Uh, I will probably mention it later. And then uh, if you have broken into the cell, of course, you can get a recording. And then to get data, you do this many, many times over. So uh, Nazrin already um, puts uh, all these little things that can disturb you or can go wrong. And today we will look into a little bit more uh, like challenges that can exist on your rig or that are a little bit more persistent that you cannot step over. So you have to solve them. So today we hope to uh, give you some tips uh, and some key points maybe to look out for on things that that can be a challenge on, on your rig when you're patching. Uh, so we will look at drift. Uh, and then we will also look a little bit at electrical noise, what to do about that. Uh, then we will have a quick look at, your, at the temperature controller. Uh, then we have some uh, tips on like starting to construct your rig or placing your rig in the right place. Uh, and then uh, we have some tips on uh, finding the right cells and getting a nice image and also finding cells with fluorescence. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is then drift. Um, so our uh, scientific manipulators are, of course, made uh, not to drift. But still, if you find that your uh, pipette is drifting, there are some things that you can try um, to just make it go away very easily. Um, and uh, when I say drift, I mean that if you are looking through your microscope, because the drift will be very small movement. So if you're looking through your microscope, then you see your pipette a move uh, in relation to your microscope so they don't stay in the same place and what is of course 
um, these are precision instruments. So what it's meant to do is you uh, you put it in a certain place, and if you stop moving the wheels, the the pipette and the microscope will stop moving, <laughs> and this is how you keep a stable patch, right? So uh, what to do? if you see your pipette uh, move. Then you can uh, check if it is the manipulator that is moving. And then for this, you should tighten the bolt on the manipulator and also have a look at your manipulator if it looks like it's mounted straight, if it's not skewed in any way or anything. Um, and that's important for the manipulator. And also on the manipulator, you have the locking stops. So I can point them out. So in this, um, uh, in this sliding carriage, for example, there are locking stops and there is this little uh, thumb screw that one should, uh, uh, because I always did this, right? I took that out when I was changing the pet pet. So for every new patch, you need to tighten that. And if you forget it, then you will not have a good time. So this is important to remember. Uh, and uh, also there's the, the rotary stage here and the base um, of the pet star on the pet star that have locking stops. And these are magnetic stops and um, they allow you to turn away the manipulator from your experiment. But when you're doing the experiment, you should make sure that the magnets that uh, make the stop, uh, like that contact on the stopping point, that they're in the right place. So uh, then the manipulator will be stable when you're doing the experiment. So you can you can change these these places where they stop with these little grub screws on the side. Uh, so you can completely customize them so they're perfect for you. So this is very advisable to do so you don't risk doing an experiment in the position where the manipulator is not in the most stable state. Um, and then on the head stage, um, you can uh, you can also check the the pipette holder. Um, and um, the pipette holder holds the pipette, and it's just a little plastic, um, plastic device that holds the pipette. But it is, uh, it has, it's sealed by two O-rings, by two little sealing things on both sides. So you can check if these uh, are tight. Maybe they need to be replaced. Maybe the whole thing needs to be cleaned so it holds your pipette firmly. It also has to be tightened properly uh, every time you do you change the pipette. And then another thing that can shift is, of course, the microscope or the recording chamber. Um, so you wouldn't see the difference under the microscope, what is shifting, if it's the manipulator or the microscope. So you should also go through the bolts on the microscope and the recording chamber to see if that's all stably mounted and if everything is uh, correct there. And then a thing that I've seen cause drift also multiple times that is a bit more difficult to control is the temperature changes. So it can just happen that a manipulator drifts in the hottest week of summers uh, of, of, of the summer. Um, and um, then there is, of course, not so much you can do, but you can always check if um, if there is air conditioning that you can use so you can keep the room at a more constant temperature. Or maybe there is air conditioning in the room, but it's blasting straight onto your rig. So your rig gets way too cold when um, um, when it's on and then it turns itself off again because it has a thermostat in another place in the room. And then your rig heats up again. Um, and the same goes for heating. There can be heating close to your rig, which, which causes temperature fluctuations. So this is important to uh, to note these things and to uh, try to fix them if possible in the place where you're patching. Um, and then last but not least is the cable management. So here we have this beautiful picture where you see many cables and you think, oh no, what a mess. But to me, the cable management is good for the manipulators because the cables are um, the cables attached to the manipulators are loosely hanging off and they have some slack. So the manipulator has the freedom to move into the sample and and uh, you have the freedom to do the movement you need for the patching uh, and the cables will never pull on the manipulator. So the, um, the scientific air rigs, they also come with a little box full of screws where you have this little uh, this little black uh, plastic holder that's very practical to screw down onto an air table and you can clamp the cables to the table with that um, uh, so that they don't like slowly start falling off the table and pulling on your manipulator. That happens also uh, in cases. So yes, then the next thing I wanted uh, to discuss is electrical noise. So here you can see our uh, uh, poster that we uh, have for electrical noise. And this lists um, 
just a list of steps that you can do uh, to find electrical noise and to eliminate it then because electrical noise can be a bit daunting it's a bit magical it can come from many places it, it can appear on certain days and disappear other days um, so uh, my first advice is to um, to look at this poster or look at this list that i have here and then just try these steps and also to ask for help then in addition maybe from uh, if you have someone who is more senior to you or has some more experience you can always ask for help if if you are in that situation of course but the first things to do are to use an oscilloscope or even just um, there's um, in the peak lamp software um, there's a pulse test that uh, that just generates pulses so you can see what's going on in your signal and um, you can then with this you can recognize um, wavy patterns that are there because uh, noise often comes from um, peripheral equipment and this will give uh, 50 hertz noise in Europe and 60 hertz of course in 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 the US um, and you can just recognize this period and you can see that there is some noise from electrical equipment on your oscilloscope or you can maybe see that it's not likely to be from electrical equipment because it looks very different so you can already uh, see a little bit what is going on and then to eliminate this noise, it helps to just systematically uh, switch off and remove and unplug all the peripheral equipment. And then especially if the rig has been in use a bit, or maybe there were different users before you, uh, it may help to redo the grounding wiring uh, because you can create loops in the grounding, especially if you keep adding new stuff on, of course. And then if you put back the peripherals, you can see maybe if the noise comes back um, and you can determine what is causing the noise and you can try to isolate this, um, place it farther away from your rig. Um, and that, uh, that should help. And you can do multiple rounds of this because if you have a big source of noise, it could be masking a smaller source of noise. And you will only find it when you solve the larger source of noise first. Um, then I will skip a little bit ahead because when you're doing this with all the peripherals and you um, you have a lot of trouble with this, you can use a Faraday cage and then you can place uh, uh, power supplies and like these power bricks that do the conversion for 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 certain equipment. You can place them always outside the Faraday cage and the Faraday cage then shields your rig and your experimental area from the electric noise uh, that comes from these components that that have to generate electricity to run the rig, right? Uh, so this can be very practical, um, in especially in persistent cases where you don't have the possibility to get away from the noise. Um, and then you can also check the perfusion system because the perfusion system is often a, a long line with salt solution, so it will pick up uh, electric noise. Um, and you can, uh, for example, check if there are cables right next to it. That's usually not very good if there are power cables right next to it. Data cables don't matter, but power cables. Um, uh, and you can even ground the perfusion system. I've seen my colleague do it with a needle, for example, through the through the tubing. Uh, or you can ground the heater that also sometimes solves um, uh, the noise. Um, and uh, last but not least, you have to check the pipette holder again um, and also what you're doing in your experiment. So the pipette holder, the seals on the pipette holder, um, if they're not tight, like you could like have a small movement in the pipette that you haven't seen or something could leak or the pressure could change. Um, so it's important to check these things. And also if the pressure changes especially, but maybe there's something else that's happening. If you're approaching your cell and trying to make a seal, uh, and for whatever reason your seal isn't uh, very good, then you will also see a lot of background noise, of course, in your recording, which can just come from uh, your seal not being very good in the beginning. So it's good to pay attention to that, if that could be a uh, cause. Yes. Um, so then I have a short note about the temperature control. Um, so we at Scientifica, we sell an inline temperature controller and there are only a few things that you should pay attention to. The most important thing is because this heats up the, uh, the, uh, the bath solution while it's coming into the bath. Um, so it heats up the, the line uh, where the bath solution comes through. And it's important to place the heater then, so this, this little part, as uh, close to the bath as possible so you don't get a lot of temperature change you know, of the liquid on the way to the bath right and there's also this probe that will measure then the temperature in the bath so this is how we keep exact control 
control of the temperature in the bath. And um, with this heater, you can set some settings in the software uh, that tell the software how to adjust and um, the temperature if it detects a temperature change in the in the probe um, and there is a standard setting that works very well to keep the temperature very beautiful and constant but uh, you have free reign over this setting so you can change it for example to um, to make sure that your bath heats up faster if that's something you would need so then maybe the temperature will be a bit less constant for you but if you need it to heat up fast, you can do that. Uh, or maybe you were forced to uh, put the heater farther away from the bath, and maybe you can adjust for that in the settings. Uh, so those are things to look for if you're struggling with keeping your temperature constant. Um, and then I said, we will talk a bit about uh, like how to set up your rig and where to set up your rig. So if um, if you're starting to think about patch clamping, it can of course be quite daunting to like to know where to start and everything, or to build a rig from scratch. Um, so uh, there are several things you can do. First off, we can help you because um, at Scientifica we sell complete rigs, so we are a one-stop shop for all the EFIS stuff. So we can talk you through the whole rig and um, uh, and tell you like what is possible and um, where you can start and everything. Uh, but when we're doing that, um, we are always asking for um, your current needs and your future plans. So we will, um, we will not just tell you everything about the rig. We will always ask you like, what do you want to do with the rig? And then we can specify uh, how the rig is set up. Um, depending on what you need to do with it. And it's also always good to think a little bit about the future. So you can maybe um, uh, add things on that you will not need right now, but you need in the future, or um, you can check if the rig is upgradable. So you can already prepare it to be completely upgradable in the future. Uh, so on that note, even if you don't uh, need a completely new rig, but if you need to move a rig or if you want to revive an old rig that is there, then we can also help you to to get the old rig up and running again and uh, add some things on so it can do what you needed to do right now. Like, and then it's important that this rig that you that you built it will be intuitive to use. So the Scientifica um, rigs are uh, usually uh, praised for being intuitive to use. Um, and you can also adapt them to your to your needs, like I showed in the software with the temperature settings. And Jeff mentioned also with the manipulates, you can adapt everything, all the settings so that they work for you. And this can be very good for new students in the lab uh, that want to learn how to patch and they need to get to something, of course, that, that works. And that is also easy to understand for them because it's difficult enough to learn how to patch. Um, and we can also um, come to your lab and do full installation and training um, on your rig. So you will actually end up with, um, with a working rig um, in your lab. But before we put the rig in a lab, it is also important uh, to check, or maybe you're moving the rig, so you want to put an existing rig somewhere. It's important to check certain things in the environment. So I thought to list them here. Um, so the the available workspace, that's the first thing, of course. You can even adapt the rig to fit in the available workspace. You can say like, oh, I wanna, I have great future plans and I wanna do a lot of extra stuff on the rig, so I buy a very big table. But if you don't have the space, you can also say, I want a very small footprint rig and I buy the smallest anti-vibration table that um, I can fit there and then I make sure the uh, rig fits. And we can help you check if it's all gonna fit. Um, but always next to the rig uh, comes um, usually a rack with equipment um, and also a computer um, and some person, an experimenter who sits there. So you need to take this into account when you're looking at available workspace. Not only the microscope has to stand there. Uh, and then there's some other environmental factors um, like I already mentioned the heating. So if you are in this position that you're gonna set up a rig, uh, then before you pick a room, you can check uh, if the heating is adjustable freely and if there are any like very acute places where it's very hot or very warm, you're in a certain stream or airflow that will uh, mess with um, with your equipment, but even maybe with the cells that you're trying to patch. It's not, not good for the sample usually to 
uh, get temperature fluctuations. And then another thing that we didn't mention yet are windows. Uh, so this gets more important, uh, I think, when you want to do fluorescence imaging, then you need to have some control over the light. So if you have a room with many windows, um, then you need at least the possibility uh, to hang some curtains so that you can, can control how much light comes into the room during your experiment. That's quite important. Or you can avoid windows, of course. Um, and then another thing to avoid is walkways, and especially busy walkways, because you have the Reagan on anti-vibration table, and this will usually cancel out any vibrations from the occasional colleague that walks by. Uh, but if you're in a very busy walkway, you get problems with vibrations and airflow again, and maybe even distractions to the experimenter. So it's much better to be in a, in a more quiet place. And then I want to hand over to Jeff again, because um, the air table, of course, filters out many vibrations, but Jeff has some tips what to do if you notice that your anti-vibration table is not filtering out everything anymore. Absolutely, exactly. So the main thing that people go straight to often when an anti-vibration table isn't working, isn't acting as that complete disconnect from the world around you, is to start questioning, okay, is the pressure correct? In, in my experience over the years, for the most part, the pressure can be really very forgiving. The table's floating nicely and it's not, you know, vibrating almost itself, which would be very easy to notice. Uh, the pressure's typically fine. What you're mostly going to see with one of these tables if they stop working is, is a mechanical short somewhere in the setup. Now, if you have a Faraday cage, these are typically either you know, mounted on top, which might act a bit like a, like a sail, which can, which can start things. So addressing that, maybe moving it off the tabletop if you can. But sometimes you have a perimeter enclosure that goes around the whole size of the table and then the Faraday cage sits on top of that. Even a really small connection, a cable resting, or things like that can cause vibrations to be transferred. Um, so going around gently, these are relatively heavy tables and there's a finger trap hazard, but go carefully around and see if you have any mechanical shorts, first of all. That's likely going to snap and solve the problems. The next thing would be kind of looking underneath the table at how the table's leveled um, and if that's all, if everything is, is floating as it, as it should be with about an even gap on all of the legs. They typically have three legs that you can adjust and there's little arms that come out from each of the pistons. Pretty self-explanatory how you adjust them and just have a gentle, you know, sort of move with them and sort of see how they react to the tabletops. Have a look at the um, pistons themselves. If you sort of see um, they're kind of pulled over at an angle, that could also be causing it causing mechanical shorts inside the mechanism. And at that point, you'd sort of either be looking at sort of knocking the top back into place, or ideally bringing lifting gear in to lift the table up, straighten the pistons as the table's off, and then gently rest the table back on. Um, if you have any questions about this, that sort of thing, or really anything along these lines, feel free to reach out to Scientifica. We're always happy to have a chat and go through by video call, just a quick phone call. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then I will do the last point, um, which is the question, is your rig set up ergonomically? So um, we have to, of course, take into account that there is going to be experimenter who is doing the experiment and they need to be able to reach everything. So they um, have the computer that they need to interact with a lot and also the sample and the microscope that they would need to interact with a lot um, with, with some then remote controls um, usually. Um, so they need to reach all this without bumping into everything all the time because that will destroy the experiment. But they also need to sit for quite long hours at the rig. So it's also good if they can sit in, in, um, in a proper position while they're doing all their work. Um, so yeah, these are the things um, that I would say are important to keep uh, in mind. Uh, and of course, I said multiple times, you can call us uh, if you need any advice. So there is a, uh, a QR code for you there for a lab consultation. Then the last two points I wanted to talk about um, have to do with getting good image. So on uh, a pet lamp microscope, there is usually um, a transmitted light path. So 
not always a transmitted light path. So it's the light that goes through the sample that uh, shows you the sample. So the light comes from one side of the sample and then goes through a condenser that focuses it on the sample. Uh, and then it passes through the sample. The sample changes the light and the objective then forms an image that with this changed light from the sample, this is the way you see what is going on in your sample and what is a good cell and what is a bad cell. So there is a simple trick to optimize uh, this uh, this transmitted light path. Um, there is a, Jeff already mentioned that there are like different contrast methods to visualize the sample and these contrast methods are applied in this light path. Uh, but for uh, all these contrast method methods, there is a condenser. And if you set the condenser right, you will get the best image out of uh, out of this transmitted light. Um, so to set the condenser right, you first would focus on your sample. It's called coding, by the way. Um, so first you would focus on your sample with the objective. So you just have your sample in focus and then you're going to set up the condenser correctly. So to do that, you close the field aperture, which is the little uh, black knob on the scientific slice scope. Um, and then you just have a small, then an iris closes and you just have a small little point of light that is coming through uh, and you can see that. So then because you can see the edge of the iris, you can focus the condenser by focusing the, uh, the edge of the iris. So you just, if you see a sharp little edge, uh, you will have focused the condenser in the correct, correct way. And after that, you, you're going to open the field aperture. Or, no, sorry. After that, first you can center this little dot that you have uh, in the middle of your field of view, and then you can uh, open it. And when you open it, you can check if it's properly centered. That's why I went too far ahead. Um, so when you, you may make, when you make it bigger, you will see if it's centered in your field of view, of course. Um, and then to go back to imaging your sample, you open it until it's uh, outside the field of view. So you have your whole field of view filled, filled with light. Uh, and then you have this light that is coming to your sample uh, through the condenser. You have it focused and centered on the place where you're doing the imaging. Um, we also have guides on this, so you can go through it step by step if you haven't done it before. And then uh, there's another type of imaging that many people use, and it's fluorescence imaging. So this is very handy. Um, to find certain cells because you often you want to patch a certain cell type and you can mark this with fluorescent markers nowadays in many models um, and then you will get way more data from this certain cell type that you're after right because you can easily find this cell so to set this up you would have to use the right fluorescent light source that fits your fluorescent marker so the fluorescent marker has a fluorophore associated or associated with it um, and this fluorophore is excited by a certain wavelength of light and admit, emits another wavelength. Um, so you need to match the wavelength of the uh, light for your fluorescent light source with the fluorophore that you're using. Um, and uh, if you don't have a light source, yes, if you're looking for a light source, then you can, for example, call us and say, ah, I want to use these fluorophores and then we can help you find the light source. Also the other way around works. If you find out what kind of light source and filter sets you have, you may be able um, to get the right marker into your sample and uh, image it correctly like that. And I just wanted to highlight that if you're starting this, it can be a bit um, it can be a bit tricky because you have two filter sets for this, and one will show you the contrast image, so that's the the gray image that you see here in the background, and the other one, um, the other filter set will show you a, a fluorescence in, fluorescent image. Um, and here you see a nice overlay, but when you're at the microscope, you have to switch between these filters. So first thing is there's usually um, a little screw or adjustable thingy so you can make the filter set switch uh, more smoothly. So there's usually a wheel uh, that's advantageous because then you will get less vibrations in your microscope while you're approaching your cell and it will be easier. Um, and then um, to check in the beginning if everything is uh, going well, you can take pictures. That, that's what I did here. Uh, and then post hoc, you can overlay these pictures and you can see if your, uh, if your pipette was um, at the correct cell that is actually fluorescent. That's a very good check um, in the beginning. And if you want to do more advanced things, of course, there are ways to uh, fill your cell and um, to do uh, post hoc stainings where you can put your 
um, put your sample under a fluorescent microscope. Um, and then you can see maybe even other genetic properties of the cell, um, or you can see if you got the right cell, if you patch the cell that you expected, and even see what the cell looks like morphologically. So there are a lot of opportunities with fluorescent imaging. So I will leave you with uh, that idea, and I will hand over to Jeff, um, who will tell a little bit more about our role in this. Absolutely. So as you've seen, as mentioned, we developed these systems from, from scratch to work extremely well. So a lot of these challenges that come up in you know, your pursuit of patching are addressed in scientific or equipment. Grounding's easy. The manipulators are rated for less than one micron of drift over two hours. Um, so bearing things like that in mind, when you're looking at your equipment, asking a lot from it is something you can do. If you're looking at a piece of scientific equipment, is it working 100% um, to spec? That means we can we can put it right. There's something environmentally that can be solved through this, um, through drip checking, through servicing of, of equipment. You know, these precision instruments and they last for many many years. Perhaps at some point they need they need a little bit of service. So it's all there to to be assisted. With. And like I mentioned earlier, you can go from adding patch stars, staging around an existing microscope you have, upgrading, or speaking to us and getting entirely full systems. Yes. And, we are. and as I say, it's the support and the ongoing relationship that's really important to us as well. Um, so we have this, this resource center, which is a really vibrant uh, resource for you guys to use quickly and as well reach out to us. We're here to help as well as a dedicated support team um, to help you forwards as well. So here's a chance to answer some of the questions that have come through and we've got some, some brilliant questions. So thank you for sending those through. If anyone's got any more, drop them in and we'll run through. We've got sort of 10 minutes or so to keep chatting. Um, before we crack on with the questions, there's, gonna, there's a poll that's about to come up asking if you'd like to be contacted um, after, uh, after the webinar. Um, Feel free to click that if it's you know, just in talking about buying any piece of kit, um, but also if you just like to chat a bit more about some of the things we've talked about just offline, feel free to drop uh, a yes there uh, and we'll just give you a call and sort of discuss what, what, what you're really interested in and how we can help. Um, so yeah, so please do click um, and answer that. Um, and I will jump in to the questions going from, so we've got three so far, so I'll start from the most um, recent and work back. So the question is, so we need to switch between the contrast and fluorescent filters in order to patch cells. Um, not necessarily, it depends how you're identifying the cells you wish to patch. Um, potentially, if you want to use a, um, if, if you want to use, uh, you know, a, a marker to identify your cells, you could identify them and then swap to your contrasted image over fluorescence and patch that way. Um, but potentially you can actually get a dual filter set that lets you visualize the, the fluorophore and visualize your infrared transmitted light. Um, yeah. That's something you can add to the system. Anything to add, you seen? Uh, I think that filter set also works for optogenetics, right? So you can do, uh, mm. because the optogenetic, if you want to do optogenetic stimulation, you can use the same light path as you use for fluorescence. So for fluorescence, so on an upright microscope, because then I can explain more clearly, this light would yeah. come from above because it's the reflected light path. Um, and if you have then a filter cube that lets through the light from above, but also lets the, um, the contrast through to your camera, you can do the optogenetics while you're monitoring your cell basically with your camera. Uh, so that's also a handy one. Yeah, and you could, you have combined filter sets also for fluorescence. Yes. But I think if you want multiple colors, yeah, you are quickly, you are turning on many microscopes, you have to turn, so. Yeah. Yes. Something with a, with to, a, to keep in mind that sometimes this is necessary. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes you will be switching filters. One thing we do quite regularly at the moment is um, make use of um, quite powerful LED um, fluorescence illumination systems. Um, you can do that one way with many different LEDs with specific wavelengths, but also you can um, do broad 
light sources and add filters to the LED itself. That lets you put a multiband filter set in your microscope and then actually change the protocols you're looking at by changing the wavelength of light you're sending yeah. to the filter set. Yeah. Uh, we design those all the time and um, can do some really quite powerful experiments because of that. Um, if that's interesting, yeah, we can we, we can talk some more. And that can be automated also. Yes, exactly. TTL it out from your protocols and everything. It's yeah, yeah it's it's really really um, it's really really cool. So um, Baptiste asked the question. Let's say the heater is heating at sixty degrees and the length between the heater and the bath. Um, won't the cell slice be damaged by throwing 60 degree, degree solution onto it? Yes, I noticed that in the um, shot we showed, uh, the maximum oh. heater setting is set to 60 degrees. That's too high. Um, well, it, it very likely is. Um, <laughs> but what we're looking at here is in the scientific heater, we run a feedback loop. So we've got temperature sensors both in the heater itself and in the bar. Oh, the so, heat. Yeah. yeah, so so what we have is actually that max heater setting can really be a way of you making sure you will never throw extremely high temperatures on the, on yourself because you're quite right, that would be disastrous. Yeah. Um, what, what you have is where we talked about setting your heater as close to your sample as possible is preferable. Um, mitigate noise and things, use a scientific heater that designed to make that extremely easy. Um, but by placing it very close, what you do is you have less loss between the heater itself and the bath. So you don't have to set the heater temperature or the heater doesn't have to run and heat the temperature up to say 60 degrees because it's losing so much before you get to your target of say 33. Um, there's, it does a feedback loop and cleverly adjusts. What you might see in, this, in these settings that we use here where the heater is very hot, you might see a lot of degassing and bubbles coming out. So that can be a challenge that you sometimes see with inline heaters. Um, changing the settings and making sure the maximum heater can't go too high can be a way of actually mitigating that as well as protecting your, um, your cells as well. Anything else you've seen or all? Um, but please uh, comment again if there's any anything further you'd, you'd like to like clarification on. That. Yes, please. Um, I actually, I'm happy that you are reading out the questions because I haven't found them yet in my screen. That's yet. okay. No worries. No worries. Uh, so, but um, I, no, I have nothing to add to this. This was perfect. Cool. So, um, a question that came through very early on in the chat. Ah, oh, actually, thank you. Glad we answered the question. Um, uh, from someone at just 60 minutes in, is, is there an opportunity to give any hint of what kind of control we need to use? Um, now, in my mind, I hear control. Oh, how we. Um, how we can, you know, how we work the movement of the scope. But I think that question is likely talking about um, controls in the actual experimental side of things. Um, um, so very much over to you, Lucina. <laughs> but what was the question? How to incorporate controls? But yeah, essentially that's my interpretation. But then we need to know more about the experiment, I guess. <laughs> Do you know and which? What, what did you tend to use? Um, yes, yeah, so I um, when I used controls, I usually had two different groups of mice. Uh, so there was one that had um, uh, a genetic modification and one that was wild type, for example. So those were my controls, um, right? So that would be that would be a good control. But if you're working working more, oh yeah, also if you're working on wild type mice, um, maybe you would want to see the effect of some drug or compound, and you would wash it on. Um, and then you can do kind of a within cell control, I guess. So you can run a protocol before you wash on the drug. Uh, and then you can run the protocol while you wash on the drug. Um, and then you see a change. And then you can, with certain drugs, you can even try to wash them out again. Um, so you can see if, the ch if it changes back to what you saw before. So this is also a control. Do we have more controls in Pets Clamp? Please give me inspiration yet, because now no, <laughs> I ran out of controls for Pets Clamp experiments. Um, there can also be, because I spoke about two conditions, right? Like there's a wild type and a mutant, but you could have three or five conditions. Uh, you just pet more cells uh, mm -hmm. before you say you see a difference. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, OK, so there's another question uh, that's just come through is, um, hi, any experience or tips for patching inserts? I have 300 micron thick inserts in the incubator and an inverted microscope to do with. 
is it possible to patch in these conditions? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit stumped on, on, on that one, to be honest. Uh, I, hate to, I hate to give a negative answer. Um, because, uh, yeah, 300 microns thick would be a typical slice um, thickness, yeah, which have... we would typically put onto an, an, an upright microscope. Yeah. Um, I guess as a as trying to be practical and be to be helpful, um, maybe my, my my practical brain clicks in here. We sort of say to look, okay, let's say it is difficult um, to to achieve the you know the patching you want to do with your particular sample with the equipment you've got. Um, Let's not despair, but let's assess what you've got in terms of the equipment, um, because there can be a lot of things that you can pour from an inverted uh, microscope, depending on what type it is, to an upright to be able to help you achieve the, um, the experiments, you know, sourcing other equipment that's already in the building um, as well. And that's the sort of thing we can totally get involved with. So I would say maybe um, if you haven't clicked yes on the chat yet, hit info at scientifica.uk. Oh, yes. Ask that question again, and we can we can find you. Because I, I think that was um, from an anonymous um, person, so we need oh. to track you down. Uh, but we'd love to help out and see if we can be helpful um, in in the future. Yeah. Um, so okay, we've got we, we've we've got a bunch. So let's zoom through. We yeah. might actually run out of time. Thank you oh. for asking so many questions. Really appreciate it. Um, let's go. Hi, I've grounded everything in our rig, light sources, pumps, tubes, with inserting needles, etc. However, I still cannot eliminate some of the electrical noise. Any thoughts on what could be the reason for this? Mm, now I have to give my thoughts, right? Um, so we yes. have grounded everything. Uh, but did you also check, like, if uh, all power supplies and everything. If there is there a Faraday cage, and are there any things that could uh, like introduce noise again that you can still move outside of this Faraday cage? Um, or yeah, mm. I don't know. Is there a bunch of power cables that runs together or something? Or do you have a little coil of power cables still lying next to you? <laughs> and it's something like that. Um, so so like I would advise to move things more away from your rig, like all the power supplies and cables. That would be my first advice, but maybe you have done that already too. Perhaps the idea of um, something like a video call with um, yeah. someone from Scientific here, we can have a look, another set of eyes on the system and see if there's anything that we can catch. Um, I wonder if you use uh, any hum silencers or hum bugs, yeah. um, to maybe maybe in the system. Um, if you have, um, a, say, a, a digidata, from electric devices for the axon setup. Uh, they sometimes come with um, inbuilt hum silences, which are designed to get rid of um, mains buzz. Um, you can add those externally by a humbug addition, perhaps as well. But yeah, reach out to us. We'll we'll, we'll have a we'll have a chat and, and uh, yeah. And but there's one thing I should add. That was also on the slide of the. Mm. Um, but if if they say they grounded everything, but they cannot pinpoint, like, um, have they tried like turning all kinds of things off and on and everything? So if you can pinpoint one thing that is causing the noise, you will have a smaller problem, right? Because you know what part you should solve. So that could, yeah, maybe help if you can say it is the perfusion or it is this one or this one thing that I added last week or I don't know, something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. And maybe we can squeeze in just one more unless we need to, to cut off. Um, let's, uh, let me see if we've got, they're all anonymous, I'm afraid, so um, please reach out if we don't answer your question, we'd love to chat. Um, but do you have any recommendations to make a seal in regards to pressure? Uh, yes, uh, make a seal in regards to, okay, but your pressure depends on your sample. And we usually apply the pressure with the syringe. And I knew on my syringe and in my tubing how much I should fill the syringe and how much pressure I should put, right? So um, the tip was to uh, put a little meter with like in line with the tubing system you have. So you can at least read the pressure so you know when you're applying less or more pressure. And then you can test it out, right? Um, also, did you know you can take off 
the pipette holder, so the little plastic thing that is on your headset, you can take it off and seal it completely with a pipette and you can dump it in a beaker with water and you can do like you will do with a bicycle tire and see where bubbles come out to see if there's any leak and you are losing pressure over time, right? So these are, yeah, these are the things to check. Like try to measure it and check if there are any leaks. Um, these are, and then also look what your tissue does. Like if we, I pet this slice a lot, but um, if you're blowing everything away, you have too much pressure. But this depends. Like if your mouse is uh, is two weeks older, you may need more pressure. So yeah, look at what looks good and what feels good. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. Do we have time for one more question or no? We should probably stop. Very nice. Soon. We should probably um, we should probably wrap up. But it's really interesting to see the questions that came through. Thank you oh. to everyone who joined us. And, um, and you sent questions in. And actually, uh, people said some really nice comments in here, so thank you for that too. Um, there's, there, there is one other, there's one final question about patching HD22 cells. Um, the key issue there being they're very thin. They're very thin. Yeah, oh. any tips for patching thin cells like HD22? I'm not the best with patching. Like I never patched very thin cells, so maybe I'm not the one to ask. Actually, then I would lower my uh, lower the pressure so you don't blow them away. Start there, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, oh, you could even adjust the um, the size of the pipette. You are free to mm -hmm. adjust the size of your uh, pipette to the size of your cell. So if they're very thin, approach angle potentially as well. Approach angle. Your your making more acute also gets more important if, you, if, you, if you're able to based on the setup and the, and the working distance you have yeah for, um, an objective perhaps um but yeah i feel like we've not given a full answer so please reach out well, again and we yeah can yeah feel free to a little bit more about get more answers and maybe maybe uh, actually here the tactics is, is also maybe i know someone who has more experience a customer that uh, we can connect you with this uh, would be a, a good tactic also in this case so uh, given given the time is running out, we've got a few questions from Emery, uh, Connie, and Federica. Thank you for saying um, that's the that's you. Um, I'll make a note of these comments, and we'll reach out to you to answer these questions um, later on. Yeah, after the webinar. Thank you for sending them through. Um, so fantastic! Thank you, everybody. And yeah, yes. I suppose thank you so much. <laughs> We're signing thank off. You so much.